Welcome to the Influence Dakota Magazine Show, the premier talk show where we celebrate diversity in business leadership and innovation. Each episode, we introduce you to leaders from various backgrounds, ethnicities, and vocations. We tell you the story behind their story of how they made it, and you can too. I'm your host, Cedric Fisher, 40-year career journalist and publisher of Influence Dakota Magazine. If this is your first time tuning in and you need more information, you can find us at InfluenceDicota.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-D-I-C-O-T-A.com. Like our Facebook page, Influence Dash or hyphen Dakota. And for all past episodes, this particular episode and all future episodes of the magazine show, go to YouTube in your search bar, toss in Influence Dash Dakota Magazine Show. When you get there, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up, like our page, and hit the bell so that you don't miss any future episodes. Okay, coming up next is our featured guest for the day, the legendary Miss Anita DeFrance. When we come back, we'll bring on Anita. Stay tuned. Anita DeFrance, Olympic medalist, vice president of the International Olympic Committee, defender of sport, a living legend, and role model to countless young athletes worldwide, has relaunched her memoir, My Olympic Life, now available on Amazon.com in Kindle, hardcover, and paperback. My Olympic Life details the tireless struggle of a young African-American girl who battled through incredible setbacks in order to captain the first American women's rowing team in the Olympics, who won the bronze medal. Following this momentous achievement, Anita continued on to become an advocate for athletes' rights when sport and politics clashed during the controversial U.S. boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games. The torch of responsibility was once again thrust upon Anita, but this time she had her sights on leading the U.S. Olympic women's rowing team past bronze and into gold. However, while she and her fellow athletes desperately tried to compete in the 1980 Olympics, the former champion faced harrowing opposition, which included personal conflict with U.S. President Jimmy Carter, who was forcefully supporting the boycott in the name of political maneuvering. Following her battle with some of the biggest names in American politics, Anita once again turned her attention towards becoming a powerful advocate for athletes and spreading the spirit of the Olympic Games throughout the world. In 1986, Anita was chosen to become both the first African-American and American woman to join the ranks of the International Olympic Committee, or IOC. In recent years, Anita once again proved to be a powerful force for fairness and justice in the international athletic community. Using her position and influence as a member of the IOC, she was directly involved in uncovering an international conspiracy to cheat the Olympics via government-sanctioned, organized, and clandestine drug doping programs. Find out the full story and learn about the incredible journey of the Olympic champion, Anita de France. Her story will inspire you, move you, and even provide an inside look in the mind of an Olympic athlete who not only overcame adversity, but conquered it on the road to victory. Okay, welcome back to the Influence Dakota show, and we are going to be bringing on our next guest. To help me welcome Miss Anita. Elle de France to the show. Welcome, Anita. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I'm very pleased to be here, and I appreciate you inviting me. Okay, we've got some questions for you, of course, and uh, it's good to see you. Before we start talking about your professional life, just share with us your background from the early days in, in Indianapolis. I often say it really matters to whom you're born, when and where you're born. In my case, that is absolutely certain. I was born into a, the fourth generation of civil rights activists and uh, my parents and grandparents, and I got to know my great grandparents uh, on one side of my family, all of them, 
and my uh, some of my well, my great uncle on my father's side of the family. So I was immense in the histories and traditions of black folks in the U.S. And my grandfather uh, hosted what was called an annual monster meeting at the Senate Avenue YMCA. By the way, uh, YMCA's that had the street number were always places where uh, colored at the time, black, African-American men knew that they could find a place to lay their heads. And that's why they were named by their street, not by some famous person or another. And the final one to change that was in Washington, D.C., interestingly enough, in the late 70s. So um, the monster meetings brought the intelligentsia of uh, the our, our community into Indianapolis and over a month, many people would come and my father had the privilege of meeting many of them. And once um, my parents were married, my mother as well. So there was so much information that I had access to and my brothers, I have three brothers, that really made a difference in my life. We knew about Juneteenth, we knew about the uh, women who were doing the computations uh, for the space missions. Uh, we knew about lots of things that unfortunately most people do not. So I was privileged with that. The only downside was that although my older brother and I were born in Philadelphia, my parents moved us, I'm sure I screamed the whole way, I was about two years old, uh, to Indianapolis where I grew up. Great place to grow up for me. I figured a terrible place to grow old, which is why after high school, I went to the East Coast. And there my story truly begins. So what was, when was it that you knew you wanted to focus in on sports? Tell us that story from the beginning up, up until now. Well, with three brothers, I knew that sports existed. What I couldn't figure out is why I could not take part. Um, I was able to be the, uh, the quarterback in touch football because you can't mess with the quarterback, so I was protected. So I can still throw a pretty good spiral. Um, but nothing else, well, that's not true, swimming. Um, when I, I learned to swim when I was four years old, and um, actually I learned before my big brother, which meant that we got to go to a lot of swimming holes where my dad taught my older brother how to swim and I'd just have fun while that was happening. Uh, but when I was, um, I believe it was eight and nine, we joined a swim team at the Frederick Douglass Park pool, which was very scary for me. It was this huge pool, oval shape, more than 550 meters across. But it was the dressing room that really spooked me. There were stalactites and stalagmites, and I hated going in there. And my dad would stand at the door to make sure I didn't get caught by any monsters. And uh, I just went home wet. I was not willing to go back in there. But that experience on a team made a huge difference to me, and I couldn't figure out why that was the only experience. The, the coach left after a couple of years, and that was the end of the Douglas, Frederick Douglass Park swim team, sadly. So I knew what it meant to be on a team, but there were no other teams allowed. So by the time I got to high school, I realized that music involved teams. So I played clarinet in the marching band, I played bassoon in the orchestra, I sang in the choir, and I sang in the magicals. So that was my team experience through high school, which led me to wish to be a music major in college. And I was for three years, and then my fourth year, they had something called student design interdisciplinary majors. So I signed up for that, although one's supposed to sign up their freshman year, not their senior year. But I convinced them that all of my credits taken in government and philosophy and even music should count. And so I became the first, and I think only, uh, in the field of political philosophy. And um, that political philosophy uh, really made a difference into how I live my life. And um, music is still a part of my life, but uh, and I still have my bassoon. But again, that lifestyle was not one that I had originally planned on. My original plan as a child was to be a judge. I guess my parents said I was very judgmental as a child, so that would be a good use of that approach. And um, so I figured I'd do that. 
And thus, after becoming a political philosophy major, I actually, at the behest of uh, Dean Jewel Plummer Cobb, who was dean of the college at the time, she insisted that I apply to law school. And I finally did. She wanted me to apply to Harvard, and I refused because they didn't allow me to go to, um, to undergraduate there, so I didn't want to waste $100 on applying there. So I applied to the University of Pennsylvania, go Quakers, which is the city in which I was born. So I figured my parents couldn't complain. And there was that little uh, added item that uh, Vesper Boat Club, which has as its motto, uh, creating world and Olympic champions, had opened their doors to women. So Philadelphia is where I went for law school as well as rowing. And um, that became quite interesting because I was going to an Ivy League law school. I was training to be a member of the Olympic team. And therefore, there was much, not much time left to be able to raise the money I needed to fund myself in law school and to pay the, the fees and to be able to, in the summer, take off and row with the team. So I took the only amount of time left, and that was the graveyard shift at the police headquarters, and also a great learning experience because we would interview defendants before they went out for bail hearings. And we, it was at a time when they were testing out uh, release on your own recognizance, so no bail money had to be provided if we gave the right recommendation. And sitting across, uh, you know, four feet from someone who had been uh, accused of some heinous crime or also what we call the pilots, drunken drivers, was no easy task, but I learned so much from that. So what pushed you to get involved with the IOC? You clearly had options in terms of what you wanted to pursue. You could have gone into corporate America or private practice as an attorney. What, what motivated or pushed you to to uh, pursue the IOC? Let me first say that being an IOC member is not a paid job. We are volunteers. So I didn't just go into the Olympic world. Um, my first step into that world was, of course, being an Olympian and living in the Olympic Village, which is unlike any other experience, I say. I mean, it was people of all shapes, sizes, skin colors, both sexes. And I realized that if we could do this for four weeks, we could do it forever. And that became my goal. So my next step into the Olympic movement, although I was a member of the board of directors uh, because of something we call the Athlete Advisory Council, which was peers voting for their own uh, to become their representative. And so from 1976, I was on the board of the US Olympic Committee, which is now the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee. and um, uh, then, after LA was selected as the host city for 1984, I was put on that board. And through that, I came to know Peter Ubroth and Harry Usher, and I wrote things about what I thought should be done. I learned later that it was, you know, it was in paper and pe pencil, because that's all I had at the time, but I let my feelings be known. I was invited to work in LA which meant leaving the East Coast and everyone I knew to go to a new city where I had met people, but I had only one friend. But I also realized it was not necessary to be cold in the wintertime. So this seemed like a very good idea. And after 1980, where I fought hard against the boycott, indeed wound up suing the USOC, which meant suing the White House because they joined in the suit. Um, sadly, I lost. I don't like talking about my losses, but I did my very best to let the athletes decide who should go. After all, we were the only ones invested. Not a penny of federal, state, or local uh, funding came to us Olympians then, and there were no sponsors. So we were all self-funded, and we should have been able to make the decision. But I lost that one, and that's a longer story. But I'll get on to other things. So once I came to Los Angeles and began um, managing and, and designing the Olympic Villages, we had three, I realized that this was really an important thing, although I knew my time was limited. And um, it wasn't 
but two years later that I was elected a member of the International Olympic Committee. So since 1986, I've been a member of this volunteer organization, which takes a lot of time, but the privilege and responsibility is absolutely wonderful. I had planned to be a member of the Supremes and don't get confused with my musical background. I met the ones in Law Groves, not the singing group. And yet moving to Los Angeles changed the vector of my career. So let me ask you this, and this is a little more of a personal question. You've obviously taken some somewhat controversial stances on some things related to the to the games, um, i.e. the transgender uh, situation. H how has your stances uh, or positions affected your, your personal life or professional life? Well, I learned in 1980 that if you take a position, you might get uh, hate mail and death threats. Back then it was, you know, snail mail, as we call it now. Thank goodness for that. Um, and here I am, still alive. So if something is important, this is what my parents taught me because we're one family, the way we spell our name, we're all related. And um, so as soon as my name got out there, I said, this could be bad. And they said, you gotta do what you gotta do. So I deeply appreciate that. I say my parents were evolved, and they certainly were. And my brothers also, you know, whatever happened with them, I, I was sorry for, but I had to do that. Now on the transgender quote issue, uh, as a sports administrator, which I lately realized that's what I had become, uh, our duty is to make sure that the field of play is safe and fair so that you know that you'll have a safe and fair chance to be uh, the best or to show that you're the best or show that you're not the best, but it has to be safe and fair. And what we don't know about transgender athletes is enormous. We just don't know. There's been no specific research on their, their strength or retention of strength after they're trans. And uh, to me, as hard as I work, you can't, it's so hard to explain how hard you work to become an Olympian. Uh, it is enormous work. Um, I recall doing weight lifting workouts where the goal was to lift 22,000 pounds in 45 minutes. Now think about that. And indeed the act of rowing itself is no joke. And then we would run stadiums or stairs when it got too cold inside the, the towers at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, and then we would, once we got back on the water, we would row 18 miles twice a day and do a six to nine mile run. Now that is really challenging uh, training. And so until I know that someone who's trans will not have the reciprocal benefits, and particularly, let me be very specific, it's after puberty. Those who are trans after puberty will retain their lifelong, uh, however long it is after puberty, that they stay in the body they prefer not to and can make the decision to do what they feel is best for themselves. I'm so glad that can happen. What I want to know is that since you're going to be the same height, your, your, your heart's going to be the same heart, I want to make sure that uh, the size differential and the challenge of training will not turn out to have additional benefits that I or other women uh, would not be able to attain. And that's the basic issue. We have no scientific proof at all. There have been so few studies, if any at all. And so until we know, we know now that until puberty, kids in sports are pretty much the same. It's after puberty that the changes begin and the benefits go to the mail. Just look at the results of the Olympic Games, of all the sports in the Olympic Games, there's at least a 10 to 20% differential going to the men. And to me, that says a lot. And until we can make certain that um, being trans does not continue that 10 to 20% differential, I think we should hold up. Very interesting. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and let's talk about your book. 
We're talking to Anita de France. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. What is Influence Dakota? Influence Dakota simply means promoting or influencing diversity and communities through opportunities, technologies, and amenities. These are key areas for building and securing a future global society. And who wouldn't want that? Influence Dakota can offer specific solutions to the actual challenges facing diversity and inclusion within today's marketplace. With the right mix of diversity and inclusion practices, shared missions, and common sense and values, we can reach our global diversity goals and build a future that's truly global in scope. Influence Dakota, offering competitive, compelling, comprehensive coverage that address the actual needs of today's consumers, communities, and commerce. Join the movement now. Welcome back to the Influence Dakota Magazine show. We're here with Miss Anita L. DeFrance today. And we'd like to talk a little bit about Anita's book, her memoir. It's called My Olympic Life. Let me just give you a little, little intro on the book. My Olympic Life is an awe-inspiring story which begins in 1950s Philadelphia where a young African-American girl battles through exceptional life challenges in order to become an international athlete representing the United States' first woman's rowing team at the Olympic Games. Serving as team captain and leading her team to win the bronze medal, the young Anita de France then faces another trial by fire, navigating the Bazatine abyss of politics, which threatened the goals and dreams of hundreds of American athletes under the grip of the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games boycott. Some of you remember that. Through it all, Anita is then chosen to join the ranks of the International Olympic Committee, or the IOC, which is the supreme governing body of the Olympic Games. It is there where she continued to protect the, the spirit of the Games, fair and free play for all, while fighting back against political intrigue, corruption, and injustice. My Olympic Life is a book that can have its place on any bookshelf, it has soul inspiration, history, adventure, and sports all rolled into one phenomenal story. If you're an avid reader, such as I am, I recommend you pick up a copy of this book and give it a good read. What inspired you to write the book? Over the years, I noticed that uh, in the media, stories would be almost correct, but something important was missing and so forth, and I decided put it in my own words would be the best thing to do. So I decided the two years that I had uh, uh, between uh, 2016 and 17, I'd work on the book and I'd work on getting the games back to Los Angeles. Uh, the reason for writing it is not only that it should be in my own words, but also to share my story because it is unusual to say the least. Um, I started out not having any access to sports and wound up being uh, an Olympic medalist and also being a member of the supreme <laughs> authority in the Olympic world and, and been serving on the executive board. And right now I'm first vice president of the International Olympic Committee. We have four year terms, which will be over, but I'll still be me. Um, my career as an attorney, I did practice law at the Juvenile Law Center, a job which I loved. I'm still in contact with the great work that they do. It's been phenomenal. It's the, they took the case to the Supreme Court, which showed that kids' brains don't finish until they're about 26, 27. So no child should be put in jail for life without possibility of parole. That's just inhumane. Um, and there are other great things that the JLC is doing. So I did that and then came working for the Olympic Organizing Committee and then my step into <laughs> uh, complete volunteer service. But also I was president of the LA 84 Foundation, which was the legacy of the 84 Games. And we were able, during my time, we started with an endowment of $93 million. Uh, we spent over 200, 
fifty million dollars, and I left at twenty-eight years later with an endowment of one hundred and sixty million dollars. So I'm very proud of that time. We taught, I don't know how many now, seventy thousand people how to coach, which is really important. Usually we say to volunteers, here's your clipboard, your whistle, go out and coach. Well, that's not fair. And it's not fair to the kids. They need to have someone who knows that they're a teacher. And that's what coaches are. They're teachers. None of this uh, no pain, no, no gain nonsense. That's the worst kind of coaching you could have. So we got taught people how to coach. We uh, made grants, uh, a lot, a lot of grants, over, I think, a thousand grants to organizations. And we have this tremendous resource. Uh, the library, which was created, is now uh, completely digitized. So it's open 24-7, 365. And you just go to LA84 Foundation, and then you'll see uh, the Knowledge Center. We did, uh, we did uh, interviews with Olympians. I got to speak to an, an Olympian who competed in the 1920 games and 24 games. So we did a lot and we hosted conferences. We had a conference on doping after the uh, 1988 games in the fall thereof and learned about the beginning of steroids and how that had happened and why at that time U.S. doctors were saying, oh, no, it doesn't matter. It's because they couldn't ethically give the dosage levels or the length of time of the dosage levels that people who were cheating were using. And if they had, they would have recognized that steroids make an enormous difference, especially in training, because when you're training, you can train harder and you can recover faster. Those of us who did not use steroids were at a disadvantage. So we were able to do conferences. We did uh, gender stereotyping in televised media and found what the, the people who are the head of the networks are doing or not doing, which makes women and girls sports seem like a, a third thought, not even a second thought, which is just not true. And by the way, women purchase 70 to 75% of all uh, athletic equipment. Now, do they use it all? Probably not, but they are the ones who make the decisions on what is bought. So folks, wake up, wake up. I'm very proud that the Olympic movement now is very close to parity, with uh, Tokyo being a little less because baseball teams are bigger than softball teams and uh, have, more, have, have more athletes. The IOC, when I started, I was the, uh, the fifth woman to be elected. Now we're at 38% of the IOC are women. And so there's been a great deal of movement. Outstanding. How would you want your book or how do you feel that it's going to influence young readers, particularly readers, readers that may be familiar with situations that are in the book? Thank you for that question. I should have written it. I should have entitled it My uh, Olympic Life So Far <laughs> when I read it, wrote it because so much has happened in these few years since then. But my hope is that kids will realize that even if you were not a part of a sports team until you got to college, you can still become an Olympian. It's not too late. Thank goodness now girls are having opportunities through, um, you know, middle school and through high school, unlike me. But for those kids who don't, yeah, there's still a chance. There's a chance to do so many things with your life that you may have thought were not going to happen. Um, for me, music was wonderful and still is, but it is not my life's work. Uh, so you can make decisions. But for me, the most important thing is to, to learn what my parents taught us and that is to ask why, and also ask why not. Specifically, we need to do a lot more critical thinking, and that is my message to everyone. We need to think, if something doesn't seem right, why doesn't it seem right? And figure that out, because if it doesn't seem right, it probably is not right. It didn't seem right that girls could not take part in sports in high school, and it wasn't right. But it took years to make it right in across this nation. So um, I hope that that truly is my message. Ask why and ask why not. Very good. 
Let's talk about some of your advocacy work for civil rights. So as a, as a lawyer and a civil rights activist, what part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement or trend do you play? What, what's your role in that? At this point, I want everyone to understand that we are one race, the human race. We are all the same, and yet we are each unique. Even identical twins are not identical. And the notion of RACE just divides us. It was created in the late 16th century to enable people to not feel so badly about pe putting people in, in, in slavery, enslaving people. And of course, over the years, enslavement changed until we made it, it made it to the United States, which was the most pernicious form of all the forms, and that's kind of American exceptionalism that really is a very bad thing. You, you know, people were not slaves, they were enslaved. You're not born a slave. You might be born enslaved, but you're a human, mm -hmm. like all the rest of us, no matter what your skin tone is. So my advocacy now is to let people get that and get the word R-A-C-E out of our minds and out of our discussions, because without that, very little will change. And I also want an end to modern day slavery. Right now, there are 40 million people who are enslaved, many of them before our very eyes. You've heard stories about the people who come, mainly women and sometimes men, have come to earn a better living and be able to send money back to their homes. And they arrive and their passports are taken and you may never hear from them again until they find a way out. And there are ways out. There are phone numbers available across the country that if you call, you will be rescued. And we, we need to do more of that. I, you know, they're not, 40 million are not all in the US, thank God. But our main ports of entries are main ports of entries under this certain kind of visa that allows people to become enslaved. And we need to stop that. We really need to recognize humans as one race, our race, and respect one another. The old golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, to me, is so clear and must be observed. Very good, outstanding. A couple more questions, Anita. Um, we have the privilege of interviewing and meeting phenomenal leaders from around the world here. This is an international talk show. And again, diversity, equity, and inclusion is really our focus. We've kind of discovered that all leaders are readers. And they typically have a go-to book, some book that they kind of refer to on a, sometimes it's a, a daily basis or maybe a monthly basis. Maybe once a year they pick it up, dust it off, or every couple of years they pick it up, dust it off, and kind of reread it. Uh, that book is typically found on their nightstand. What book is on your nightstand? Playing in the Dark is just as remarkable. It was really a set of lectures given at Princeton. It's a small book, but it takes a long time to read. And um, Toni Morrison is the author. Unfortunately, she's left us. But if you can read that, you'll learn a whole lot about this nation and how the RACE word has entered in uh, the lexicon in ways that are almost impossible to remove. But Toni Morrison, and I'm also reading N.K. Jemison, who's a science, science fiction writer who has a trilogy that is just fantastic, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. She has replaced for me um, Octavia Butler, who passed away, and she was a wonderful science fiction writer. Both are my skin tone. That's fantastic. We'll have to look for those books. Last question. Uh, and first and foremost, we want to thank you for coming on the show. The legendary Anita L. de France. Uh, if folks who are viewing this, and again, this will go around the world, are interested in reaching out, getting in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, the best an easiest way is my website, anitadefrance.com. Um, I'm also on uh, um, YouTube. I have a, a YouTube uh, channel. 
I'm also on um, all of the other social media uh, platforms. Um, you know, you can find me anywhere. But again, the easiest way is through my website, AnitaDeFrance.com. Well, thank you again, Anita, for coming on the show. We appreciate having you. Tune in next time when we bring you another influential leader on the Influence Dakota Magazine show. We'll see you next time.